I'm a partner here at Mercy View, and tonight we have two scripture readings. The first is Philippians 2, 14 through 16. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine like the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. And Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Whatever you do, do at, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Good evening. Uh, how are we doing tonight? Well, good. Okay. Good. Quiet out there. Yeah. Um, well, hey, my name's Trey. I serve on staff as the executive director here at the church. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Before we get into the passages that Meredith just read for us tonight, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who was out here yesterday for the volunteer training. It is uh, not an easy thing that we ask folks to do to help make the church run. And I don't think we say thank you enough. And so I want to say that again today. Um, thank you for being there. Thank you for um, the way that you serve Mercy View now um, and the way that I, I know so many of you are, are gearing up to serve in the future as we move into uh, this next season as a church, which it dawned on me today. After tonight, there's two Sundays and then we're on Sunday mornings. Um, it's a lot faster than I thought it was in my head for whatever reason. So it's coming up, guys. Um, and I just want you guys to not only be aware of that, but uh, just think about and pray that God would uh, allow us to move into this next season uh, with uh, grace, with uh, a kind of efficiency that we need to make things work. Um, and if you would be praying for, for us who are uh, helping coordinate and lead this, this effort, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, one quick announcement that we have before we dive into the text this evening. Uh, this is just coming from the mission team. I want to make you aware that the last couple weeks of this series, so Brad's going to be preaching another message in this series next week and the week after that. Um, and we have a group guide that's going to be going out to all of our GC leaders um, on evangelism that's kind of centered around this series. We just want you guys to be aware of that, uh, just to know we're going to take this conversation that we're having on Sundays and we're going to press it a little bit deeper uh, in the coming weeks. GC leaders, we want you to know that that's coming just so that you're able to be on the lookout for that in your email. Uh, I'll be emailing that out this week um, and uh, we think it'll be a good fruitful time for us together. Uh, well, tonight we're talking about uh, going and telling the gospel, missional living in everyday life. And we're, we're going to look at how that impacts the space where we spend most of our time. I was having a conversation with a friend a few months ago that I used to work with. And uh, this friend, by their own admission, would at best be a, a nominal Christian. Like they believe that God and Jesus are real. They pray and, and they would say they try to be a good person, but if pressed, they wouldn't necessarily say that their hope, their, their foundation is found in the finished and atoning work of Christ. And we've had several conversations about the gospel over the years. And because of that, uh, they knew that I would be a good friend to ask about a weird encounter they had with a coworker at the place that they work now. Uh, one of their new coworkers is, by all accounts, a Christian and someone that it seems that has a deep desire to practice evangelism in every area of life. And so they'd had a few conversations about, from what I can tell, just in my conversation with my friend, was the gospel. And after their most recent interaction, uh, they asked my friend, do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe he rose from the dead? Do you believe he's the only way to life? To which, feeling a little blindsided and caught off guard and wanting to get out of what was becoming very fast and awkward conversation, my friend just answered, yep, absolutely. And this coworker proceeded to lead them through a repeat after me prayer and said, awesome, you're saved now. You should come to church with me. Um, they had a few conversations about this. Uh, this, this guy uh, had my friend pray this prayer. My friend, as they relayed this conversation to me, was a tad bit shell-shocked and confused uh, and in our conversation, I got to ask some follow-up 
questions. And, and the reality is what, what they admitted to me was they answered yes because they just wanted out of that current situation as fast as possible. And at the risk of making someone who's in here tonight uh, that's already a little worried about sharing the gospel, a little more afraid about evangelizing and about being someone who shares the good news of Jesus Christ with your friends, with your neighbors, with your coworkers, can I just say that this kind of drive-by evangelism is oftentimes going to have this kind of result. I don't know the guy. I wasn't there for the conversation. But I do know my friend, and I know my friend walked away feeling a little bit ambushed and less certain of where they stood before God than when they walked into the conversation. As we think about evangelism, what it looks like to live on mission in everyday life, the reality is that we have to think about the gospel and how it relates to what occupies the majority of the waking hours in our week, week in and week out. How should we as Christians, seeking to be faithful to Christ's call to go and make disciples, think about sharing the gospel in this place where we spend most of our time throughout the week? How does God desire our work to be marked by the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? Today we're talking about work, but I want us to start this conversation today um, and, and with you to know that when I'm talking about work and when we, we mention work today, we're not talking necessarily just about the thing that someone does to draw a paycheck. And the examples and illustrations, the, the majority of them that I'm going to use tonight, they're, they're aimed at what the majority of us do, which is some kind of work for a living and for, a pay, for pay out in the workforce. But when we think about work, we need to think about it more in terms of the vocational task, like this primary thing that we spend our time doing day in and day out throughout our week. We need to think more about vocation and less about what the IRS would tax you on. Vocation is what you spend your time doing. And, and I want to talk particularly, when, when we think outside of just the, the nine to five categories, I want to talk primarily to stay-at-home moms. Listen, you have work. You have a vocation. And God cares about you. And he cares about you being a light, shining forth the hope of the gospel in the space that you spend your day. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because let's, let's be honest, every parent knows this is true. A stay-at-home mom is surrounded by some of the most cunning little sinners that the world has ever seen. They are tiny and cute and sticky-fingered kiddos, and particularly the ones who haven't reached the point where they understand the gospel because they're young, because they can't grasp it just yet. They also still lack the kind of inhibitions and inclinations toward having a little bit of decency and manners that your childish coworkers still have because they've grown up a little bit. It's hard work. It's sometimes thankless work. Kids don't know those kind of baseline decent manners that bridle uh, those others around us. Mom's still teaching those things. That's her task. And listen, Mom, I want you to know that your vocation, what you do, it matters, and your kids need the gospel as much as anyone else's coworker who might not know Jesus. Here's the point. Here's where we're going tonight. God cares about what we do. He cares about our work, and he cares about how we do it. Because your work and how you do it is a tool for God's glory and a means of God's saving grace being distributed to those who need to find salvation in Jesus, wherever you find yourself. So to that end, I have two questions I want us to answer tonight that I think will help us frame what missional living in this corner of our life looks like. And the first one is this, does your hope mark your work? Christians should be a people filled with hope because we should be people who understand that our purpose and aim in life is God's glory 
and finding joy in him. The second question we need to ask ourselves tonight is, do others know who I work for? Because at the end of the day, first and foremost, the Christian works for God and not for men. So with that, let's think about this question first. Does your hope mark your work? So let's open back up Philippians 2. Uh, Paul isn't here in this text explicitly talking about work. This passage isn't necessarily about vocation. It's definitely not about the kind of work that you and I tend to find ourselves doing. He's talking about life in general, which I think is actually really helpful for us because as the categories are broadened out, We see that when Paul says what he says in verse 14, to do all things, it includes the things that we're doing 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And I want you to just pause for a second and think about how hard that actually is. And how often that doesn't actually happen at work. I've had several different jobs in several different industries. I've worked in construction, I've worked in food service, I've worked in the church, I've worked in a mechanic shop, and I've worked your typical eight to five office job. And you know what all of those spaces have in common in spite of all the differences that exist between them? In every one of those spaces, even in the church, there is always something that's going to get grumbled about, and hopefully to a lesser degree, but in some, some cases, maybe to more of a degree, and I think thinking back to the mechanic shop, there's a lot of disputing, and there's a lot of arguing, and there's a lot of backbiting that takes place in the work setting. And as Paul is laying out what it means to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling that he's talking about in Philippians 2.13 and 12, it seems that recognizing that part of what God's doing to work in us, to will and work for his good pleasure, is working into our bones as Christians a kind of contentment with life that is alien to the world that we live in. It's foreign to the world that we occupy. That's what sits underneath the not grumbling and complaining, disputing and arguing. See, content people aren't the ones who complain. And genuine contentment oftentimes keeps you from complaining even when you might have a right to. In the same way, content people aren't the ones picking fights. They're not the one egging on the fight because they have nothing to prove and therefore nothing to defend. Look how he keeps going. Because it's not just that God's work in our hearts produces contentment, but his, this holy contentment begins to transform us. He says, God is doing this in you. You need to be content without grumbling, without disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. There's a lot to unpack in that part of the sentence, but first, the, the, the kind of contentment that God works into the heart of his children through the Holy Spirit, it makes us holy. Paul's using this language of holiness, of sanctification, of of being set apart and separated from. Those who do all things without grumbling or complaining or becoming, uh, they're becoming blameless and innocent without any blemish. See, God's purpose for our lives is for us to literally become this spotless people that stands out from the rest of the world, that is a shining city on a hill. Because what he describes the the rest of the world as doing is not becoming blameless, innocent, or without blemish. He makes this stark contrast. He says those who aren't in Christ, they're becoming more crooked and twisted. See, the Christian as God's workmanship, as those God is working in to will and work for his own pleasure. They're like trees in a well-managed orchard. Every branch being trimmed to perfection. Meticulously placed for the best results and the greatest yield. But those who are outside of Christ, they're like the wild branches of a thorn bush. In a sense, they grow just like the trees but its branches are twisted and mangled. 
Any fruit they might produce is bitter or outright poisonous. He draws an even more explicit contrast in the text. He, he, he says that it's the difference between darkness and light. As I think about darkness and I think about this description of being crooked and twisted, what came to my mind was uh, the entrance to every like evil cursed forest in like a cartoon fairy tale, right? Like it's, it's twisted and mangled branches and thorns that are growing up into this canopy that no sunlight can enter into. And what Paul says is that as, as believers, what God is doing in us is the antithesis of that. The Christian, though, content in Christ, they shine as lights in the world. Holding fast to the word of life. And so here's the point. Here's, here's why we need to think about this idea of contentment. Christians are or should be people who are marked by contentment in every area of life. And for the Christian, that contentment comes from having hope. Because hope breeds contentment. And that's true for anyone in and outside of Christ. That hope actually allows us to be content. Outside of Christ, though, it's a temporal kind of contentment. It's something that can and does fade. Like your coworker that complains all day about what they have to do in their job, they might be perfectly content the moment that they clock out. Because they know they get to hop in their car, drive to Turkey Mountain, slap on their helmet, and go ride down the mountain bike trails all evening. In that moment, they're content. But that contentment is temporal. It's located in the amount of time that they have to do the thing that they love, or whether or not they get injured or sick. But the implication from verse 14 for the believer is that Paul says we're to do all things with this kind of contentment. There's a hope for the Christian that just doesn't fade regardless of circumstance. Because it's a hope that isn't located in our temporary circumstances, but in the eternal and perfect will of God. And so for the Christian, our contentment is meant to carry over into every corner of our lives because our hope is all-encompassing. This is how Peter describes the Christian hope in 1 Peter 1. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This living hope, it includes an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Initially, I was going to stop there, but just listen to how Peter continues to describe this kind of living hope and think about the way that this gives us a hope that births real contentment. He's talking about this inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, this hope, you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The hope that we have is a hope that moves beyond whatever circumstance and whatever situation we find ourselves in. And that includes whatever our work might look like at this moment. And so how does that connect to missional living in that space? Well, I want you to think for a moment about the you that exists Monday through Friday. The you that exists when you clock in in the morning or when your week starts. I want you to ask yourself, does this kind of hope, this living hope that's rooted in this unfading, imperishable, never-ending, more valuable and more worth its weight in gold, 
kind of inheritance? Does this hope mark your life at work? Like if I were to walk into your office tomorrow and talk to your coworkers or your boss, would, would they be able to say, maybe not in these exact words, they might not have the language for this, but would they be able to articulate that there is something about you that is so full of hope, that is so content with where you find yourself in life, that it marks you as different. Or is your life marked by a sense of discontent, of disunity, of, of listlessness? Mom, at home with the kids and stressed to your wits end because one won't stop crying and the other won't stop asking questions and none of them listen. Do your kids get glimpses of hope-fueled contentment? Sure, not in every single moment. But the nature of your work is that in your place of vocation, all the good and all the bad are seen all at once because it's home. But when those moments of sin come up, do they get to see you hit reset and respond by looking to Christ and finding confidence in what He has done for you? They see you dealing with the stress of not having enough of this or that or things not being cleaned the way they should. Do they see you approaching all of these things in life without grumbling and with joy? Listen, no matter where your vocation has you, inside or outside the home, in the service industry or the medical field, turning wrenches or making copies, here is the reality. We are called, yes, to preach the gospel with words, but with our life as well. Your life should be preaching a sermon right alongside the words that you speak. And many times, maybe most of the time, in the context of our vocation, it is the sermon of our life that gets preached first. It is the way that our life is different that opens the door for the hearing of the gospel that God has called us to proclaim boldly. And listen, I know it's easier said than done. Because part of the reason that our work is so sometimes just grueling is because our work's been cursed by sin. Like part of the curse in Genesis 3 was on the ground. It was on the place where Adam worked. And God said that because of sin, thorns and thistles would come up and that it would become a burden and toil. Don't hear me discounting that. Like, don't hear me discounting that you might have a genuinely crappy job that makes life in that position toilsome and that toilsomeness palpable. Yet even in the midst of that kind of situation, in Christ, we have been set free from the curse of sin and death. And that means that our work, or at least the way that we approach it, doesn't have to be toilsome in the same way that it does for those outside of Christ. We can approach it with contentment and with purpose because we have hope. Which leads me to the second question that we need to ask. And the one that drives us from preaching a gospel without words to the various opportunities to do what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15 and give a reason for the hope that's in us. Do others know who you work for? Look with me at Colossians 3.23-24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And one of the things I'm most thankful for now in my 30s that I was much less thankful for in my teens is that my youth pastor discipled me through teaching me to work. I didn't know that's what he was doing. Maybe he didn't even know that's what he was doing, but that's what was taking place. Like looking back now, from the first time that he had me mow the churchyard to the hours that we spent hanging sheetrock in the gym because our church was too cheap to hire somebody to finish the job. We had to do it ourselves. I was learning how to connect work and worship. There was this connection being formed between what I was doing 
and the way in which that could honor the Lord. And it's really easy to see as a teenager mowing the church lawn and hanging sheetrock in the gym. Like, it's easy to see how that is working heartily for the Lord because I'm serving the cause of Christ in my city at that point. Now, these things are connected to the church, but they were doing something else. They were teaching me this value of working hard and working well and doing it all with excellence for God's glory. Like, he drilled that into me. And that started before I was able to actually have a job. And so when I was able to actually go and have a job, there was already this thing that had been worked inside of me that was able to connect the things that I was doing with my hands, what I was finding to do, to what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, right? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. And the implication is it's because God has given that to you and you're doing it not for men, as Paul says, but for the Lord. See, God created work as a good thing to be done for his glory. Before sin enters the world, God gives Adam work. Work is not a part of the curse. Our work has just become cursed. And though stained by the curse of sin, good work is still a way that we have to worship God with all of our hearts. Listen, your work is not primarily about putting food on the table. It is about the glory and honor of God. We have to shift our perspective and our mindset to see that. No matter how bad you think the job that you have is, and it might be bad, it pales in comparison to the original audience that Paul's writing to right here. Paul penned these words to the church in Colossae, and he's, he's in this section where he's talking to households. And so he's talking to husbands, and wives, and children, and in this section, he's talking to a group of people that the ESV translates as bond servants. These are men and women who, more times than not in the first century, had sold themselves into what can be described at best as servitude, but in reality is a form of slavery in order to pay off their debts. And I can imagine that there aren't a lot of cases where this kind of work was particularly pleasant or fulfilling. And I don't think it normally endeared those who were bond servants to those who were masters. Yet Paul's expectation for the Christian, the Christian bond servant, is the same as to the church that he writes to in Philippi, to do all things without grumbling or disputing. But he takes it up a notch here in Colossians. He wants these bondservants to recognize that as believers, the way they approach their work should be aimed higher than their earthly master. They work not for men, but for the Lord. Now, be honest with yourself. Is that the way that you approach your work? Do you approach your work as if you are working heartily unto the Lord? Do you view what you do as something that serves the cause of Christ in the world and brings glory to God? Or is it just a means to your own ends? Do you just punch a clock and breeze through some task each day? Do you strive to do your work with excellence because in doing so, you know that it reflects on your Father in heaven and not just the company's bottom line? Do you do it with excellence? It's not because you want to climb the ladder or make your boss happy, but because you just want to honor the Lord. And he's given your hands something to do, and he says to do it with all your might. Here's where doing your work as unto the Lord becomes not only a means of worship, but also a means of mission. Consider, how would approaching your work with excellence because of Christ cause you to stand out from those that you work with? Like if you were not only to do everything with contentment rooted in your hope in Christ, but with excellence and diligence, maybe going above and beyond what's required, because you know that it's going to bring God glory, how is that going to make your life look different? Or think about it this way. 
Maybe you don't work in a job where the culture of the company is just to kind of do a little bit and whatever you need to get by. Maybe you're not working in an industry where like you have the opportunity to go or, or where you can choose not to go above and beyond. Like we live in America and there's this thing inside of our culture that is just fueled by workaholism. And this desire to continually work more and more and more. And working for the Lord and not for men looks like being willing to look at your work and say, this is not my ultimate aim. And God has called me to take time and seasons to actually rest. See, working for the Lord and not for men means that our aim and our purpose is Christ and Him first. And so what that could look like is working above and beyond. And what it could look like is being willing to say, I don't have to work to prove myself. I've been proven by Christ. He's my hope. Your context is going to determine what that looks like for you. But no matter what it looks like to work well and for the Lord, what it will begin to do is it will begin to give you opportunities to do what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15. It will give you opportunities to speak to the hope that you have because the hope that you have is going to breed contentment in your heart. It's going to breed contentment in your life. And as it does that and you begin to work not for men but for God, people will notice and they'll have some questions. And I can say that with confidence because that's happened to me. Like in the last job that I held, I got to have conversations with multiple people about the gospel simply because the way that I approached my work was looking to honor God and not myself. I remember one conversation about the gospel with a friend was simply based on the fact that we were laughing at one coworker who got really annoyed by the fact that I would come into the office like with a smile on my face and a little chipper, maybe a little too chipper, okay? Like, I like to laugh. I like to like have a big smile on my face. And we were laughing about the fact that there was this one coworker of ours that was super annoyed about that. But he asked me, he goes, hey man, wh- why, like, like, why are you happy? <laughs> Like, what is the reason for that? Because he kind of wasn't. And I got to tell him that my hope was in Christ. And it really didn't matter. All the drama that was happening in another office, it didn't matter how much my workload, what that looked like. I could be content because I had hope in Jesus. Did that lead to him saying the sinner's prayer and coming to church? Absolutely not. That conversation, I, it, it didn't lead necessarily to conversion, but it did lead to the opportunity to plant seeds, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that my prayer is someone else will water and God will begin to grow in my friend's heart and that someday I'll stand around the throne of God with him. But what it took was being willing to live life different than the way that culture approaches life and work. What it took was being willing to look at life and say, in all things, I'm going to be content. I'm not going to grumble. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to argue. Didn't do it perfectly. None of us will. But if we approach life in this way, I promise that you will have an opportunity to do what the Word of God says and give reason for the hope that's inside of you. Listen tonight, we'll close it out here. We could have talked about ways to share our faith with that girl in the desk across from yours or how you could structure your kids day to continually point them back to the gospel and a hundred other good things that can be effective strategic and and that can be talked about should be talked about and i could have told you a better way to do what the guy at the beginning did with my friend but instead we just ask these two questions and unpack them Does your hope in Christ mark your work? And do others know that you work for Christ first and foremost? And so why focus here? It's because being able to honestly answer those two questions with a resounding yes is going to almost always be more effective than any other strategy that you can employ. See, when your life is marked by a hope-filled contentment, 
and a work ethic revolving around the glory and honor of God explicitly. It is impossible for others not to take notice. So like Paul says, we shine like bright lights in the darkness. And when we are working for Christ and not for us, that light is always leading people back to him. And when they notice, and they will, we get to be ready in season and out of season to give a reason for the hope that's in us. Let's pray.